Have you ever wondered how to pray effectively? How to make sure that your prayers were good prayers, prayers that would be heard and answered by God? In our readings this Sunday, God says that he is going to draw the Israelites or the Gentiles into the people of Israel. Their prayers, their sacrifices are going to be acceptable upon his holy altar. And in the gospel, we see a Canaanite woman coming to Jesus. And this Canaanite woman, this woman who was not just a pagan, but she was from the peoples that had been driven out by the Israelites, that had been a snare to the Israelites for centuries. A Canaanite woman came to Jesus and she teaches us how to pray by her example. What does this Canaanite woman do? She begins by calling out, have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Have pity on me. The first thing in prayer, in prayers of petition for ourselves or prayers of intercession for others, is to ask for God's mercy. God's mercy, his compassion, his pity. To recognize that we need something the first thing we need individually is we need forgiveness of our sins. So the first prayer for ourselves should always be for forgiveness before we go on to ask for anything else. So she comes on the scene asking for pity, asking for mercy for herself and for her daughter. She recognizes who Jesus is. She calls him Lord, son of David. She recognizes him as Lord and Messiah. Implicitly, whether she realized it or not, she was recognizing him as God, as the Savior. And then she stated what her need was. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Very simple. She didn't tell him what to do. She didn't tell him how to do it. She just stated her need. So often when we pray, we tell God how he is to answer our prayers. God, I need you to do this. I need you to do it this way. I need you to do it at this time. That is not how we should pray. We pray by giving our needs, telling God, this is my need, and leaving it in his hands. Now, the gospel tells us that the disciples came to Jesus and said, please send her away. She keeps calling out after us. So even though St. Matthew doesn't tell us, she's repeating it again and again, but she must have been because she didn't let up. She kept calling out for his mercy. She persevered in prayer. And then our Lord tells the apostles, I've only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I think this is a test because Jesus had in fact preached to the Samaritans and he had preached in the Decapolis, which was largely was a pagan area. So I think he was testing. Mainly he's there for the people of Israel. What does she do? Does she say, oh, well, I'm not of the people of Israel, so I'm just going to walk away. He must not have anything for me. She comes up to him, humbles herself before him and says, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. How simple a prayer. Three words, Lord, help help me. And Jesus puts her off again. Again, I think he's testing her because he says, it's not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody called me a dog, I'd be like, I'm out of here. 
I, I want nothing to do with this person. But no. She uses what Jesus said. And she says, but Lord, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from their master's tables. She humbled herself. She accepted being called a dog. And with that humility, she persevered. And Jesus said, great is your faith, woman. Let it be done as you have asked. And her daughter was cured of the demon. In this story, we see four keys to effective prayer. The first key is we have to pray with faith. That is, we have to recognize who he is. He is God and I am not God. I need something from God. I recognize who he is. God is not just like some magic um, gumball machine that I can put in my quarter and turn it and get what I want and then just walk away. I recognize who he is. So the first key is faith. The second key is humility. We don't have anything owed to us by God. God owes us nothing. He is infinite goodness, infinite being, infinite love. And he made us out of love, but he doesn't owe us anything. We are creatures. We are his children. Recognizing the, that fact and humbling ourselves. Instead of being like, God, you owe me this. That humility is the second key to effective prayer. The third is simplicity. Stating what we need in a, in a simple way. Not babbling on like the pagans tended to. Like it was a magic trick and if they just did what, whatever they kept talking, eventually the gods would give them what they wanted. Stating our need and laying it before God. And the fourth key This is terrible. The four, humbly, oh, persevering. We have to be persistent, just like that woman was. She didn't just say it, she kept at it. She kept asking. So our four keys, faith, he's God, I am not. Humility, God doesn't owe me anything, I'm asking. Simplicity, I ask simply, without expectations, without telling God what to do. Perseveringly, I continue to ask. Now, why do we need to continue to ask? Sometimes when we pray for something, God says yes, because it's good for us and he wants to give it to us right away. For example, if we sincerely want to be forgiven of sin, God always says yes, and he says so immediately. Sometimes God says, wait, this is not the best time. It's not the right time for you. Sometimes God says, no, I have something better for you. And sometimes God says, keep asking, because Saint, as St. Augustine said, our hearts are small. And sometimes what God wants to give us is so much bigger than what our hearts can contain that we have to keep praying to expand our hearts so that we can receive what God wants to give us. Let me illustrate prayer with a few stories from my priesthood. Many years ago, I was doing coverage on a military base, and the, the day before I was leaving that assignment, I was asked to go to see a woman who was, had been found to have over 100 blood clots. 
They were going to do a procedure the next day. She wanted to receive the sacraments. So I went, I spent some time with her, I heard her confession, I gave her the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, prayed with her, and I left. And the next day, as I was driving back to Kentucky, I got a phone call and somebody said, you know that woman you went to anoint yesterday? I said, yeah. They said, well, she went in and they were, did one more scan of her body before they would begin the, the clot busting medicines. They found no clots. Simply praying, she submitted herself to God. She received the sacraments. I take no credit for this. This is all God's work. I'm just the priest he happened to use the thumb and the oil to anoint her on the forehead and the palms of the hands and to say the words. The Lord gave her a cure. She prayed with faith. She prayed with humility. She trusted. She received a cure. But not always do we have cures happen. As those of you who have been around for a while know that about six years ago, my brother was in a desperate battle with cancer. And this fall will be six years since we lost him in that battle. We prayed. Matthew not only prayed, he invited other people to pray with him. And thousands of people around the world were praying with him. He taught people through his Facebook page about, about prayer and about trust and, and had people, invited people to follow with him in his journey. We prayed for a miracle. We prayed for a miracle through the intercession of Father Augustus Tolton, who Matt had, Matt's last film project was helping his friend Chris Foley to do the first part of the movie about the life of Father Tolton. If you're not familiar with Father Tolton, he was the first black Catholic priest in the United States. And he had a terrible time going through the seminary, getting ordained, being persecuted by other priests. And he's up for canonization. Well, Matt had a devotion to Father Tolton and we prayed we wanted a miracle through Father Tolton, help Father Tolton get beatified. We didn't get the miracle we prayed for. We got something that I think is more important. There was spiritual healing. There were relationships that were healed. During his years of traveling and with his wife putting on music programs in churches, there had been priests and bishops and bureaucracy of the church that had caused Matt a lot of pain. Sure, you can come and give a concert that will help people to deepen their love for Jesus, but you can't get anything to support your family for doing it. Some literally would not let them sell tickets, take up collections, sell CDs, nothing. And Matt said, how am I supposed to take care of my family and the other people dependent on me if I have no way of getting income? There'd been a lot of hurt. But during the course of his illness, different priests, priests that he'd never met before, came when he asked for a priest. They spent time with him. One priest from Nashville went and Matt wanted to make a general confession and that priest came and spent time with him to do that. At another point, Matt had a bad turn and I was out in Oregon and I called a priest in Nashville and he dropped everything and went immediately to find Matt and to take care of him and to give him the sacraments. And that meant everything to him. And there was healing. There was spiritual healing from what bad people in the church had done, overcome by the love of others. He even had a vis visit from Bishop Joseph Perry, who is the postulator of the cause of Father Tolton. He wanted to come and spend time with Matt there in the hospital and pray with him. And what a beautiful thing when some bishops had been knuckleheads and there were other bishops that 
accompanying Matt in prayer and one who went, went and personally spent time with him. Sometimes the answer, the prayer that we're making doesn't have the answer that we might want. And maybe only when we see God in the face will we understand that the answer we got was the best. But our prayer will be effective if we pray with faith, with humility, with simplicity, and with perseverance. I'd like to share with you another story. I was preaching a mission down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast in a town near Biloxi. And this was shortly after Hurricane Katrina. And as I was taking a walk one day, there was a, a black man who was walking about a block from me. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, go meet him. So I sped up so that I could meet this man. And I said, hello, how are you doing? We had a little chat and he said, are you a Catholic priest? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, I've got a story I need to share with you. He'd been living in upstate New York, probably Albany, I think. Had a nice job, a beautiful apartment, top floor of a nice building. Had a girlfriend. They had a baby together. Life looked good. Everything externally was good. He lost his job. He was losing his apartment. His girlfriend decided to leave. He wasn't going to see his son any longer. And he said, I went to the top, the roof of the building, and I was about to jump. And I heard a voice that said, if you do that, you'll go straight to hell. And he looked around and there was nobody there. And he said, I went back down to my apartment and I took out my Bible and I began to pray. And he prayed for a day or two, just humbling himself, asking God for light, reading his Bible. And there came a knock on his door. And he opened the door and there was a Franciscan priest standing there. Now he said, now we've got to back up. That morning, the priest told him that he'd gotten up and he was praying. And he felt the Lord say, I want you to go take a walk. And he said, Lord, where do you want me to go? Just, just walk, I'll guide you. He's walking along, goes by a bank, and the Lord says, go in and take out $300. What? Go in, take out $300. So he did. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Just keep walking. He's walking by the bus station and the Lord says, go in there. What? Go in and buy a ticket. Where? Buy a ticket to Biloxi, Mississippi. So the priest went in, he bought a one-way ticket to Biloxi, Mississippi. And he says, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Just keep walking. That building. Take the elevator, that floor. Get on that door, knock on that door. And so the man opened the door and the priest is standing there and he says, I don't know why God wants me to give you this but apparently he wants me to give you $300 and a ticket to Biloxi, Mississippi. And the man said, I decided God spoke to me. That's what God wanted. And he said, my friend said, why would you go to Mississippi? They're racist. Don't you remember Mississippi burning? He said, apparently God wants me to go to Mississippi. So he went. And he said he got robbed in Baltimore. But the last half of the journey, every time he was hungry, somebody would cut their sandwich in half or give him an apple or something. And he arrived in Biloxi with nothing but the clothes on his back. And he got a job. And eventually he got a home and he got married and had a family. Had his own business. 
which was destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. And he got another job and he was starting over. He said, God wanted me to be here. God had a plan. And he said, and they're not as racist in Mississippi as they were where I came from. The Holy Spirit wanted me to meet him. He humbled himself. He had faith. He asked God for help. Basically the same thing as the Canaanite woman. God help me. And he persevered in prayer. And God helped him. My brothers and sisters, if we want to be effective in our prayer, not treating God like the divine gumball machine, not telling God what to do, not having expectations of how he is going to answer. But if we want our prayer to be truly effective, pray with faith, with humility, with simplicity, with perseverance, and God will answer your prayers. God love you.